lot of space in the front of the room, right? So you do not have to crowd in the back. Um, please, please come forward. I'd like to welcome you all to the first NanoEd Tech seminar in this um, fall semester, fall 2019. Um, and before I introduce today's speaker, I want to make two announcements. Um, so the first one is um, the, the next NanoEd Tech seminar is on September 10th. Is that two weeks from now, or is that it's two weeks from now, I guess? Um, again, 12 o'clock in this room here, and our speaker at, at that time is not going to be from Georgia Tech, but from the University of Pennsylvania, Igor Barda, Bargatin, uh, and he will talk about plate mechanical metamaterials and their applications. So that's on September 10th. Um, before that, on September 6th, is our user day. Have you all heard about the IEN User Day? No? Um, if you are using the IEN core facilities, this is kind of a, um, uh, a day where you can highlight what you're doing in terms of research and share with your fellow PhD students, postdocs, and so on, um, what you are doing in the IEN core facilities. This is uh, September 6th. There should have been plenty of emails going out. Can I do a quick poll of who has um, already registered in this room for the user day? I was expecting it's the other way around, right? I expecting not 10%, but 90%. So please consider if you're doing work in the IEN core facilities, being the clean room or the materials characterization facility, consider signing up for this event and consider um, doing a poster, and this can be based on a poster that you have shown at a conference before highlighting your research that you're doing in the facilities. I think we're going to have a really, really interesting plenary speaker, plenary speaker at that day, Julia Greer from Caltech. Uh, so her talk will be titled, what is it? I had it at one point. It's not on that sheet. Oh yeah, there it is. We'll speak materials by design, three-dimensional, 3D, nano-architected metamaterials. So again, a metamaterials talk. Uh, I think really we are very, very happy to have her here on, on September 6th. So please consider signing up for that event and, and joining the talk, the poster sessions, the lunch, and all other activities that day. Quinn, anything else to say about? Thank you, sir. All right. Um, and with that, I'm really, really happy to introduce today's speaker, um, my colleague, and I think I can say friend, right, um, Matawan Swaminathan, uh, <coughs> who is, um, just to give you a little bit introduction, uh, who is the, where's my cheat sheet? My cheat sheet is here on the back, who is currently the John Pippin Chair in Microsystems Packaging and Electromagnetics in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Georgia Tech. He has a joint appointment in the School of Material Science and Engineering. And since about six months, um, he is the new director of the Packaging Research Center here at Georgia Tech. Uh, just a few words about, about Swami's credentials. Uh, it's a very, very long list. He got his uh, master's degree and PhD. Uh, in 1989 and 1991 from Syracuse University. He went to IBM afterwards uh, doing packaging for supercomputers is what I, um, what I have kind of remember. And then came to Georgia Tech in 1994, so 25 years ago, is that about right? Uh, <clears throat> he has been involved at Georgia Tech in, uh, in a number of um, center activities. He was part of the ERC. Um, that started the Packaging Research Center back in the days. He founded C3PS, the Center for Chip Package and for Co-Design of Chip Package and Systems. So C3PS, and again now heavily involved in the Packaging Research Center as the new director. Um, he has more than five. He and his students have more than 500 publications. I read something like 20 plus best poster, best paper awards. Uh, that he has had with his students. Uh, we are very, very happy to have him here today. Uh, and he will talk about, the title is going to be System Scaling Through Heterogeneous Integration. Um, please join me in welcoming Swami, Madhavan Swami Nathan. So 
So here is the great. It's okay now? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks once again, uh, Oliver, for that very nice introduction. Uh, it's been 25 years that I've, uh, uh, you know, since I moved to Georgia Tech. And during those 25 years, I have basically moved eight offices, believe it or not, eight offices, with the eighth one being in the microelectronic, the Pettit building, basically, where I moved into as of uh, last week. Okay, I'm still trying to open my boxes and things like that. Um, so anyway, so it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, the title of this presentation is System Scaling Through Heterogeneous Integration. Uh, I've been working in the packaging area now for 30 plus years or so. And over the years, I've seen various aspects of packaging. And, and thanks to some of the efforts that we had at IBM, uh, it led to this first engineering research center at Georgia Tech called the Packaging Research Center. And 25 years later, the PRC is still thriving. That ought to say something about packaging and how important uh, packaging is. So what I'm going to do today is to try and paint a picture at a fairly holistic level on the importance of packaging as well as uh, some of the technologies that uh, we, are, uh, we are trying to develop at, uh, at PRC. And before I get started, I want to acknowledge the many students. We have 50 plus students now involved with the center today, around 25 faculty involved, lots and lots of staff involved. Let me acknowledge all of them. So what I'm going to share with you today is not just my work, but it's a, it's a collective effort. So if you enter the Pettit building, the minute you enter, you'll see this figure on, on the wall in that building. And I think this is a very nice way of illustrating what system scaling is all about. Right? So when I started uh, at IBM, we used to build these very large machines. And packaging was a very integral part of it. And uh, over the years, as you can see, the kind of computers that we were able to build has you know, changed quite a bit. And it's coming from two sources. One is, of course, trying to scale the transistors. And the second is the packaging as well. If you look at the kind of packaging that went into these large machines, this was uh, the CPU alone required around 127 chips that had to be interconnected on a package with around, I would say, uh, 150 layers of wiring and so on and so forth. And today, if you look at a lot of the packaging that we use in some of the newer machines and some of the smaller machines that are shown over here, the dimension of that package has come down quite a bit, along with the size of the ICs with lots and lots of wiring in it. Okay? So if you look at system scaling and look at this figure, it's clear that the systems of today are a whole lot smaller compared to the systems that we used to build around 25 years back. And so if you look at scaling here, okay, size has in decreased quite a bit. So size in in includes the volume and uh, the weight and so on and so forth. The performance has improved many fold. Nobody can argue with that. And the third is the functionality. So the, the machines that we build today, not only does it do computing, it does many other things as well. And hope is that sometime in the future, you'll have something that's implanted, hopefully not, but maybe implanted in the human body that does uh, amazing things for you. So if you look at system scaling, the question you need to ask yourself is, how does one scale systems? Right? And at a very holistic level, you can break up a system into two parts, the transistors and everything but the transistors. And if you look at the transistors, you know they are at nanoscale. So we know that we are you know, down to the 7 nanometer technology today. But if you take all of the ICs and all of the transistors in a system, you'll find that it constitutes less than 20% of the volume of that system. The remaining 80 to 90% comes from everything that's outside of that system. 
and that's what we call as packaging. And if you look at the dimensions of the components that we make use of on the packaging side, it is much, much larger than what you can do on the transistor side. So when you ask yourself the question, why are systems bulky, have low performance, costly, unreliable, and so on and so forth, right? It's not just about the transistors, but goes way beyond that. And that is the important message over here. So transistor scaling alone is not sufficient for system scaling. You need to work on package scaling as well, okay? Scaling of the package is as important as scaling of the transistors. So what exactly is packet scaling? So let's take an IC and uh, the IC has transistors in it and you build these transistors using different kinds of technologies. It could be CMOS, different kinds of materials, gallium arsenide, silicon germanium and so on and so forth. So when we talk about IC scaling, we are basically taking these transistors and scaling those transistors to make them smaller. And when you scale these transistors and make them smaller, especially if you're trying to go after CMOS types of transistors, they become much better in performance and so on and so forth. So you get large amount of benefits from it. And this is what we call as Moore's law. But then if I have to build a system, those transistors alone are not enough. And that's where the package comes in. So to get these transistors to work, you need your power sources. You need a battery, right? You need your thermal structures to be able to get the heat out because not all transistors are very efficient. You need the board level technology to be able to connect all these ICs together. You need the cables and connectors to be able to interface with the outside world. Right? And you have lots and lots of these passive elements. These are resistors, inductors, capacitors, filters, waveguides, MEMS types of structures that you need to get this to work. That's where the functionality comes in. And of course, today if you look at the cell phone industry, the trend is not towards making the cell phones or the smartphones smaller, but to make them extremely thin, right? So therefore, you're, you're trying to backgrind the IC and to be able to embed it in the package so that you can make your systems uh, uh, no, ultra thin. And the way you make this happen is through different technologies, just like what you do on the transistor side, you can use organic laminate kinds of materials. You could use ceramic materials, thin films, silicon, glass type materials. You develop processes around it in such a way that you take all these components and try to miniaturize them quite a bit. Right? So therefore, if you're looking at system scaling, you're trying to miniaturize the transistors and miniaturizing the package. And what I mean by the package is all the components that you have including the wiring that goes outside of that IC to be able to connect all these transistors together. Okay. So that brings us to scaling trends. Now all of us are familiar with Moore's law, right? And that's what is indicated by this line over here, which says that the number of transistors doubles every 18 months on an IC. And it's done amazing things for us in terms of the performance we've been able to get out, out of these transistors. But then there is another metric that is very, very important that is coming from the packaging side. And that's what we call as the system component density. It includes all of the interconnects and every other structure that I showed you on the previous slide that allows you to build a system, right? And unless the density that you have outside of the chip is in track with the density of transistors that you have within the IC, right? When you put the two together, even though you have tiny transistors, it's going to lead to bulky systems. Okay? So what we are trying to do, or we would like to do, is to find a way to reduce this gap in terms of what we have been able to do on the IC side, let's say driven by Moore's law, and trying to sort of uh, uh, you know, miniaturize these components outside of the IC that is driven by what we call as more than Moore's law. Okay? And the end goal is to reduce this gap as much as possible. So we want to make sure that tiny transistors are assembled onto tiny packages so that you can build your system. Okay. So that brings us to the concept of heterogeneous integration. So heterogeneous integration 
neither is it only about the transistors or the devices or nor is it only about the package okay but it's a combination of the two because you're trying to build a system that has you know different kinds of uh, functionality embedded in them so think of a system where the system consists of very advanced devices this could be the 3d memory devices the spintronics the compute logic and so on and so forth and you build ICs with it with different kinds of technologies and then you are assembling it onto a package at very very fine pitch okay such that the package has functional layers in it that allows you to minim miniaturize the components that you need to support the RF functionality, the optical uh, and so on and so forth including your heat dissipation capability right. And together if you are able to do this well it can lead to these scaled systems okay. So if you look at the industry today right there is a trend all of a sudden towards heterogeneous integration. And those of you who saw the CEO from Global Foundries talk I think last semester or sometime during spring I believe, um, you would have heard this, you know, he was talking about heterogeneous integration as well. The question is why, why would a company like Global Foundries be talking about heterogeneous integration and part of the reason why is because as you begin to do things more and more monolithically on a single IC, the die cost begins to go up exponentially as you begin to scale the dimensions or the size of those transistors beyond the 10 nanometer node. Okay. So there is a sweet spot in terms of what you want to accomplish in terms of the die area and the die cost when you do the scaling. But then you still have to build a system and instead of trying to go after this monolithic integration that can be very very expensive there is a trend towards what we call as polylithic integration where you take multiple chips you take an ASIC you partition it into smaller chips that we call as chiplets and you connect them all together using very very high density wiring on a packaging platform that is shown over here and this uh, you know this line came actually from DARPA they are saying that the shift to packaging is important because that is the most cost effective path towards to further system scaling. Okay. So with that as a background let me get, dive a little bit deeper into it and I am going to start looking at different kinds of applications where we believe packaging can play a very very important role and some of the research that we are working on and all of this research is pre-competitive research. So let us take this example of flying these intelligent drones right. The hope is that someday you have these drones if you look at uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the news from Amazon they are talking about having these drones flying everywhere dropping packages for you right. So the hope is that these are intelligent drones that can fly themselves can navigate by thems themselves. So how is it being done? So this is one example is a colleague of mine uh, Professor Arjit Ray Chowdhury who is working on uh, artificial intelligence based uh, you know drones and so on and so forth. So when you build these kinds of drones there are two parts to it. One is you are trying to fly this drone in an environment that is well known right. So you are trying to have the drone learn in terms of what is going on around the environment and then there is a second part where you are trying to fly this drone in an environment that you really do not know much about and it is learning in the process okay. So there is one part where you are pre-training the drone and the second part is the drone is making use of that information to be able to learn as it begins to navigate through uh, you know this, uh, this hallway that is shown over here. So if you take this, you break this up into what actually goes inside of the drone, it looks in this form. So there is some kind of a camera okay, that is taking pictures so it knows exactly what the environment looks like and then there is a lot of memory right. So the, you have the DRAMs, then the STT RAMs and so on and so forth along with logic and you are trying to implement this intelligence in two forms, one is through these convolutional neural networks 
and the idea here is that you want to be able to reduce the amount of communication that you have between the neurons and therefore you try to uh, uh, you know make things very fast and the second part is through transfer learning so now you are trying to make use of the information that you have already learned in a new environment you are transferring part of that knowledge to be able to learn what is going on in this new environment to understand how to navigate right. So, if you take this problem and break it up into the hardware side of uh, things right what you want to do is to do very fast computations in a real unknown environment and what that translates to for us who design you know packages and so on and so forth is very low latency interconnections. You want to be able to communicate between the logic chip and the memory chip at very very high speeds right and the second part is you want to make sure that these drones do not begin to fall from the sky right because of lack of power and it turns out that when you look at these computations 70 percent of the power is consumed by computing it does not come from the motors that go into that drone it actually comes from computing and the only way by which you can conserve your battery is by making sure that you have this very low energy per bit connections or communication right. And you also want to make sure that you have these very high reliability connections that you can establish in this kind of a, of a, of a, of a hardware ok. So, let us look at the system architecture itself. So, if you go one layer down what you have are, are a bunch of chips that are connected to each other right and depending on the kind of neural network that you are trying to implement the connectivity between the chips is going to be very different. Okay. So, that is why when you look at AI types of applications it is the application that determines what the architecture is going to look like not the other way around most of the time we build CPUs right and build an application around it with a lot of these AI kinds of applications you are doing exactly the reverse right. So, in this particular example you have a bunch of chips that are connected to each other through very dense interconnections. And what you want to do is if you look at the connectivity it is across the edge ok. So, it is an edge to edge connection between the chips and you are going after these massively parallel architectures. And your goal is to be able to transmit this these bits at a very very high speed between these chips getting you up to maybe around 16 gigabits per second or so right. When you are trying to do that there are cert certain metrics you need to worry about and given those performance metrics the question is how are you going to sort of achieve them. The first metric is you want to have a very high aggregate data rate between the chips going beyond let us say 1 terabit per second and what that translates to in terms of these wiring structures that you see over here is that you need very very high density wiring along with a very fine assembly pitch when you try to assemble the chip onto that substrate. The second is what I had mentioned earlier you need very low energy per bit going down to 0.1 picojoules per bit or so and the way you do that is by making these lengths of these interconnections extremely short and making sure that the capacitance associated with it is very very small as well and that is part of the reason why you literally want to brick wall these chips right next to each other and run these wires from one chip to the other and the third is this uh, lower bit error rate this translates to the reliability of the system you want to make sure that there are no errors. So, when you have a bunch of bits that you are uh, uh, transmitting you want to make sure that you never get into a scenario where a bit 1 gets recognized as a bit 0 or vice versa right. So, the bit error rate is a very important metric of that and this is where the crosstalk that you have right between these interconnects along with the power delivery schemes that you actually make use of come in comes into play. So, how do you make this happen ok and there are only two ways to do it one is what we call as 3 D integration. So, 3 D integration is you begin to stack chips on top of each other. So, you reduce that interconnection length and do the communication there are companies like TSMC and um, you know companies like Intel and others who have started releasing products right. One of the challenges that you have in 3D integration is that it is very hard to go beyond two chips in terms of your ability to bond these chips together and connect them to each other and there is always an issue related to power delivery and thermal management. And the second way to do it is what we call as 2.5D integration 
those are the lateral connections right that you have from chip to chip that is shown over here you need both moving forward because a lot of the memory structures we are going to have is going to be 3d 3d stacking of ic's and then you have the logic that's going to be separate and you want to connect them all together through this two and a half d kind of a uh, solution so how do you go about doing it now if you look at the landscape in this area there are several solutions being proposed right i'm not going to go through every one of them the one that appears to be mainstream today is to use a piece of silicon to do the interconnection between the chips we call that as the silicon interposer kind of a solution and you have companies like tsmc who have a process around it so you can tape out your chips tape out your package and they'll build it for you right what i'm going to do is to talk about a different technology that we believe gives us some opportunities that you can never get or advantages you can never get with the silicon interposer technology and that's what we call as the glass interposer technology okay so once again this is all pre competitive and ongoing research right and the idea here is to do something new that nobody else is looking at such that we can achieve things much more than what some of the present technologies are able to support so the idea is the following you take a piece of glass okay this is thinned glass and the dimension of the glass itself can be either small or large and you these kinds of glass substrates come in different thicknesses let's take an example here you are taking a 300 micron thick glass substrate right and let's say that and if you take a glass substrate it's an insulating material unlike a semiconducting material like silicon right so therefore it gives you some nice properties as you get into higher frequencies. Now let us say that you drill holes through it, let's say through a laser, right? And you fill these holes, you metallize it. And then you begin to laminate, right, polymer layers on either side and metallize the top and bottom layers of this substrate to create your interconnections on them. We call these as the redistribution layers or RDLs. And then you assemble the ICs on top of it at very fine pitch going down to maybe 10 microns or less in terms of pitch and on the other side you take this and mount it on a printed wiring board right now the argument I'm going to make is a structure like this even though it has many challenges that one needs to overcome to get it to work it gives you some opportunities that you will never be able to get with most other technologies especially when you're trying to get into very very high density farming okay the question is why so prc has been working on this for five to six years or so so why is this so unique okay so so let's look at the advantages okay so one of the nice things with glass interposers is that it comes on very large panel sizes okay and these are square panels not circular like unlike like a silicon wafer these are square panels and therefore with this large substrate sizes I'm uh, sorry large panel sizes depending on the size of the substrate you can argue that you can build many of these all in parallel you dice them up and therefore the cost of a single substrate can actually be low the second is that you're not limited in terms of the aspect ratio for the interconnects that you actually build right and think of structures the very tall structures that allows you to reduce the resistance of these interconnects quite a bit so that you are able to transmit these bits at a very very high speed the third is that you can do a direct attach of copper slugs to the ic now if you look at an application like a smartphone application where the thickness is very very important right then you have to take an ic you have to thin it and you have to embed the IC and you want, do not want to introduce any parasitics by assembling this IC onto the substrate instead you want the seamless interconnections that are shown over here we call this as fan out panel level packaging right but on the other side you want access to the back side of the IC so that you can get the heat out right and you have an opportunity when you work with these kinds of materials to expose the back side of the IC and attach a copper slice the CT of the material itself if you look at these glass 
substrate materials, what is shown over here along with these mat polymer materials that you have on either side, you can build a structure such that you can tailor the CT of that laminate them on top of each other basically using an adhesive, build a structure a multi layered structure that has some very very interesting properties with it. And of course, this example is from Corning where you can you work with very very large panels and get into this roll to roll manufacturing if you like. And finally, the reliability, remember that this package is in between the chip and the board. So, you want to make sure that on one side you are able to get high reliability as far as the chip goes and on the other side you want to get very high reliability as far as the board goes. That is what we call as the fatigue life. Okay? So, you do not want these connections to break and by tailoring the CTE of that substrate you basically can ensure that you can match or at least improve the fatigue life of the chip side as well as the, the board side, so that you can improve the overall reliability of the structure. Okay. So, this is what it would look like. So, this is what I was mentioning and most of the time when we try to use a silicon interposer kind of a solution, notice that there is another package that you need over here, that organic package acts like a buffer okay, that allows you to match the CT that you have on this side with the CT mismatch that you have on, the, on this side. So, most of these silicon interposer kinds of solutions will have an extra layer of packaging that you can eliminate by using this glass interposer technology. Okay. So, we you know PRCA has been working on this for quite some time, these are some examples that I am going to uh, flash through. There are several processes that we have been developing working with different kinds of materials, low stress materials, low, K, low DK, low DF materials developing a process and we are able to do lines and spaces of the order of 2 microns line width and 2 micron line spaces, very similar to what the silicon interposer technology is able to do. We are also able to build these micro vias. So, the dimensions of the vias that you have when you look at these RDL layers is down to around you know a few microns or so, okay? around 4.5 to 5 microns or so. And we are also trying to develop a way by which you can assemble these chips at very, very, very fine pitch onto this substrate using new concepts uh, based on this nanoporous copper film sintering that gets us down to pitches of the order of 20 microns or so. Okay? So, so, what does this actually buy you? Okay? So, let us go back to the metrics that I mentioned. Right? And what you have on the x axis is the channel length. And the y axis on the left hand side represents your maximum data rate and the right hand side vertical that you see is the energy in picojoules per bit. Because you have reduced the length of the connections right, and because you are able to use dielectric materials that have a very low dielectric constant associated with it, you will find that for any given channel length the amount of energy that you consume for transmitting each bit as well as the data rate you are able to achieve is roughly two times better than what we are able to do with the silicon interposer solution. Okay? And one can argue that that is not good enough and what this kind of a technology buys you is that if you look at a lot of the artificial intelligent ty ty intelligence types of applications, the size of the substrate is beginning to grow not reduce right? and the reason is because you want that interposer to look like your printed circuit board. So, you want to sort of pack as many components as you want and as the size of the substrate actually increases and you begin to get this kind of performance, you start getting a lot of more advantages as well. In addition to that, when you begin to optimize the aspect ratio, right, you will find that you can get to very, very high data rates along with very high signal density. Signal density is of the order of around 330 signal lines per millimeter with data rates of the order of around 15 gigabits per second. And if you look at the total throughput you are able to get, the estimation is that it is going to be of the order of around 8 terabytes per second or so. And all we have done over here is to play and optimize the aspect ratio of these interconnects to be able to get there. So, let me switch gears a little bit and get into another application. I think that uh, is very most uh, 
applicable for many of us. And that is it, that, that is the area of data centers and energy, right. So, if you look at all these data centers, right, um, that, uh, that the Googles of the world actually build, there is a power source that, that is powering up all these data centers. And if you look at that power source, it comes from the AC side, right, it comes from the power grid. But ultimately, you are taking that AC source and you are converting it into DC and then you are down converting it to a, to, to a voltage that you can then use to switch these transistors. So, the transistors switch at a voltage of let us say 1 volt and each block that you see represents the down conversion from one voltage level to the next. And if you look at the numbers within each one of these blocks that represents the power efficiency, right. So, it basically means a high, high value of power efficiency over here means that the total power at the output is very close to the power at the input. Any difference represents the wastage in energy, right. So, if you go through these blocks and go to the very last two blocks over here, you are down to 85 percent and 65 percent efficiency. You take the product of the two, you are at 55 percent. What that means is that for every two watts of power that you draw from the power grid, one watt is being wasted, okay. And that is creating a huge amount of heat. And the bottom side is, bottom line is, if you have a way by which you can improve the efficiency, let us say by 20 percent in the last two blocks, it directly translates to a 20 percent uh, reduction in energy consumption. Okay? So, how do you do that? Okay? The way you do this is by trying to bring your power source as close to the chip that is actually drawing the power, right. So, therefore, you want to take that buck converter, what we call as the point of load converter, move it closer and closer to the chip. And by doing that, right, you are reducing all of the losses due to the shorter current paths and therefore, you are bumping up the efficiency. It is easier said than done because to make this happen, you need very high switching speeds for these kinds of uh, buck converters which requires new device technologies. So, you cannot do work with silicon, you have to go to gallium nitride technology and you also need very high power efficiency which means that all of the passive components that you that you need outside of the IC should have very very low loss uh, low loss associated with it. Okay? So, that comes to the power delivery scheme and one can argue that if you are trying to go after this heterogeneous kind of a, a concept, heterogeneous integration kind of a concept you are working with multiple ICs where let us say one of the ICs that you are trying to integrate in the package is a buck converter right that is in very close proximity to the SOC then you get some very significant advantages and one is the power efficiency. And the second is the fact that it is very close means that all of the current is going through very short distances on those interconnects and therefore, you are reducing the losses even more. Okay? So, we call this as an integrated voltage regulator and uh, to make something like this happen, you need these inductors that are embedded in the package right outside of that IC. So, how do you do that? A very important metric is the amount of current density you can support for these kinds of uh, integrated voltage regulators. You want to get to around 10 amps per millimeter squared or so and at the same time you want to reduce your parasitics as much as possible to ensure that you keep your losses low and that is where the module thickness comes in right as well as the interconnect length comes in. And the only way to do this is to replace all these discrete components that you have with thin film components that are embedded into the layers of the package okay? and that is what is indicated over here. And this is some work that we did a few years back and the idea here is to build these inductors that are integrated along with this buck converter on a single package. And if you look at these uh, in uh, the, uh, this kind of a, a module here, you do not have to work with very advanced technology nodes for your buck converter unlike what one needs to do if you are trying to integrate that buck converter into that SOC which is what is shown on the second column. So, you do not have to work with a 22 nanometer technology for the buck converter. Instead, you work with a 130 nanometer technology, you embed your inductors in the package, switch your buck converters at a very high frequency of the order of 100 megahertz and get efficiency numbers that are very close to a, to a SOC type of a solution. Okay? So, by the way, the second column is what Intel has demonstrated a few years back. 
So if you look at a lot of the future power delivery solutions, you want to take the last two blocks that I showed you for those data centers, combine them together, okay? And that's what we call as a single stage 48 to 1 volt power conversion. And that requires new device technology, for example, gallium nitride technology. And this is what we are working on, okay? So you want to be able to switch these devices at around 10 megahertz or so. And if you look at the figure of merit, you know, assuming we are able to do this, right? you get tremendous improvements in power efficiency as well as figure of merit we are able to achieve a solution like this. So this is what we are working on. So think of these gallium nitride devices that does not have to be N-GAN, it includes P-GAN as well, right? assembled at very, very fine pitch onto a substrate or a package where you have embedded capacitors and embedded magnetic layers and you could have the SOC on the same package as well. But in this embodiment over here, you have 48 volts goes in and 1 volt comes out, right? At very, very high currents of the order of around 200 amps or so. So this is some work we have been working on, uh, on magnetic materials, okay? And this is a very, very difficult problem because you know when you work with these magnetic materials, depending on how you synthesize these materials, you're always limited in terms of the maximum or the, uh, the, the value of permeability you can achieve and at the same time the magnetic loss tangent that you are able to achieve. And most of these materials as you go higher up in frequency, the magnetization completely goes away and you are left with a very, very lossy material. Okay? So synthesis of these materials are very, very uh, important and we have been working on trying to work with these magnetic sheets as a way to integrate these inductors and that is what is shown over here. So this is some work that we are trying to do to be able to get very high inductance densities okay, at very, very low loss by trying to reduce the magnetic loss tangent as much as possible and building these toroidal inductors that you can embed inside of that, uh, inside of that package. And uh, the next area is in the area of embedded capacitors. This also is very important because with all these point of load converters at the output, you have a low pass filter circuit. You have a series inductor that is generating the current for you and then there is a shunt capacitor that is uh, controlling the voltage ripple, right? So that capacitor is as important as that inductor that generates the current. And unless you are able to embed these capacitors and ensure that it has very, very low parasitics, you're not going to be able to manage the voltage ripple for uh, these kinds of converters. So this is some work that we've been doing recently. In fact, uh, Grant Spurney just graduated. He just defended his thesis. Uh, he's part of uh, the material science department. And so what he's been working on is to try and create these capacitors using uh, tantalum oxide dielectrics. Okay, this is a paraelectric material that gets you some very interesting properties in terms of the capacitance density that one can achieve with this. And if you look at the process itself, we try to build it separately and then it's a transfer process. So, so we transfer the film onto the substrate that we are actually trying to build. And what Grant has been able to show is that he's been able to keep the ESR extremely low at around one megahertz, right? With a capacitance density of around one microfarad per millimeter squared. Very hard to do at the package level because of the coplanarity of the package layers itself, but this is something that we've been able to accomplish within PRC that's considered to be state of the art because if you try to compare it with everything else uh, that is available as discrete components, this compares favorably. <laughs> Another area or application is in the area of communication and all of us are familiar with 5G and what it does. But there's also another uh, frequency band that is emerging in the area of sub terahertz communication, right? And if you look at a lot of the applications here, it's in the area of MIMO communications, imaging, non-destructive testing, and so on and so forth. But the frequency range that is being targeted, it's between around 0.1 to around 1 terahertz. Question is, if these are the, some of the emerging applications, what are the packaging technologies that you need to develop? And one example is shown over here. So if you look at the transmit module for a sub terahertz communication kind of a vehicle, 
the amount of heat that you are going to generate is between 5 to 10 times higher than what you have for a 5G application. And part of the reason is because if you look at these power amplifier chips that are going to be built using these 3-5 materials, they, their efficiency tends to be very low. The best efficiency you are going to get is of the order of around 25 percent, which means 75 percent of that power gets converted to heat. So, you have to be able to get the heat out and the only way to do that is through the back side of the chip. So, think of a glass interposer or a glass substrate which is extremely thin as thick as the thickness of the chip itself. You are creating cavities in it and these are the through cavities. You embed the dye in it right ensuring that there is no dye shift and then you are trying to remove the heat from the back side using let us say a vapor chamber that is embedded in a cavity in the printed circuit board. Okay. So, this is ongoing work, but you get a feel for some of the technologies one needs to develop moving forward right, to be able to support a lot of these applications. So, building cavities becomes extremely critical and this is some of the latest uh, results that we have in our ability to build very you know, high precision cavities. And if you look at this substrate over here on the back side, you actually see this sheet of glass laminated on it, it is transparent you do not see it. You can also etch it out, so you can remove this part. So, you either have a through cavity or you have a blind cavity right and you can embed dyes in it with very minimal dye shift of the order of around 2 microns. Okay. So, you can build extremely thin modules with it. And this is our grand vision and grand goal to be able to build a module like this, stack these modules on top of each other with along with the antennas, so that you can do your scanning both along the H and the E plane at a frequency of around 140 gigahertz. It is the D band right and these are N fire antennas Vivaldi arrays that are all integrated into this glass substrate. So, with the remaining time that I have, which is a few minutes. <laughs> Let me just get into the very last topic and then I will stop. Okay. Now, as we build these systems and as we begin to design these and develop new technologies, the complexity of these systems is increasing many fold. It is getting to a point where it is becoming impossible to actually design these. Okay. So, the question is can machines help design these systems and more importantly, if you are trying to design such complex systems, you get into this issue of design respins, right? Because you are making mistakes and you are respinning it till you get it right, and that is a terrible way of doing things. Okay? Can machines help do that? The second is the reliability. You have both the hard and the functional errors. Can one improve the reliability of these machines at the design phase, and can the machines begin to predict failures of these, right? And also can machines help determine new packages and system architectures. Right? So, overall what we want to do or what, have, what our thinking is, is to start looking towards machines to improve human predict, uh, productivity by orders of magnitude. So, what we have started doing within the PRC is to create a machine learning environment that allows us to work on different types of designs working with different kinds of materials and different kinds of processes under the hope that the designs that we actually tape out are extremely robust and makes full use of the processes and the materials that we make use of. Okay. So, I am going to talk very briefly about one aspect of it and that is in the area of design optimization. All of us are familiar with this issue right, you are trying to design let us say a chip or a, or a system and there are lots of parameters you need to tune right and you begin to tune them and then you realize that it is taking forever and you take shortcuts and you decide that out of the 100 parameters only two are important you focus on these and in the process you make the mistakes and as a result you have the designed respins. So, the question we asked ourselves is can we make use of machine learning as part of this kind of an environment to be able to ensure that we do not make those mistakes okay, so that we can end up with an optimized design. So, what is the issue over here? Right? So, if you look at the general area of optimization where you are trying to optimize the design, 
And if you're looking at an, a response surface like this, that is of the convex type, right? You'll find that almost any optimization technique that you make use of will always converge to this global minimum that is shown over here. Very easy, right? But in reality, when we work with designs, right, and different kinds of materials and processes, etc., you're working with a response surface that is extremely complex, okay? And in the midst of all this, you're working with lots and lots of parameters that you need to tune to be able to get you the optimum design, right? And this is what we call as a hard compute problem. And if you look at a lot of the people, both on the hardware on the, and the software side, they're trying to tackle this issue by coming up with new devices, new interconnection technologies, as well as new software techniques, okay? So what we've been doing is developing techniques specifically for packaging that allows us to come up with very, very robust designs. And I'm just going to focus one of these over here and show you the result over here. Okay, so this is a high speed channel. So you are connecting chips to each other, running bits at a very, very high speed. And you want to optimize the system such that you get the better, best performance possible. And if you look at the simple example over here, there are only six parameters that you need to tune. And if you look at all possible combinations, it takes forever to do this, right? So you don't want to be able to do this manually. So by using these machine learning techniques, right, we are able to make predictions in terms of what the performance of this interconnect channel is going to look like. And if you look at this, right, machine learning is very good at making predictions. But when you look at the kind of problem we are trying to solve, which is an optimization problem, we're making use of stochastic techniques to be able to solve the problem, right? So when you're making use, making use of these statistical techniques, there's always a certain level of uncertainty associated with how good your prediction is. So therefore, what you want to do is that along with the predictions that you're making, you're also trying to provide an uncertainty around it, indicating how good is your prediction. So that in case you feel that the prediction is not good enough, you can always add more training data to it, right? And all of that is done automatically, adaptively, without zero human intervention, okay? So this is work that's going on. So the validation cases that you see over here represents predictions. So there are two lines on top of it. One is actual, and the second is predicted. And if you look at the predicted one along with that, you have the shaded area that represents what we call as uncertainty bounds. It tells you that this is the prediction that we are making, but there is an upper limit and a lower limit in terms of our confidence bounds, okay? And that gives you a wealth of information in terms of how reliable the system is actually going to be. Okay? And we've just started working on this, and this is really the very last slide, for the technical part. And what it basically says is that if I have a bunch of materials available to me, a bunch of technologies available to me, why do I need a human to determine which combination of technologies is going to give me the best solution? Why not make use of machines, okay? And this is a project that we just got started. And I make the statement over here just to you know, get all of you motivated that we can begin to use a lot of these machines or machine learning based algorithms to do a lot of the designs and the predictions for you, okay? So with that, I'm going to conclude. So uh, I want to recognize all of the, the students, the faculty, the staff, or part of the center, there are many of them, as you can see. We also collaborate with, uh, and, and the faculty come from four, four different schools. We also collaborate with many uh, uh, companies as well as government uh, 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 organizations. And what we are trying to go after is what we call as a mega center on packaging, okay? Not only do we want to be focused on the packaging side, but we also want to make sure that the package enables what happens on the silicon side, the chip side, as well as on the system side, okay? And the idea here is you connect the dots, you'll always be able to come up with the smallest system possible, and that's what we call a system scaling, right? So these are our current collaborators, 30, more than 35 of them, and we also have these shared user PRC facilities they're all part of IEN today for all of you to use. So with that, I just want to summarize. 
saying that when you talk about system scaling, please do not ref look at only transistor scaling. It goes beyond that, it includes packet scaling as well. So with that, I'm going to stop right here. And if you have any questions, I'll be very, very happy to answer. Thank you very much. Um, we mm -hmm. have maybe time for a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, so you showed a graph of a data rate for a class and silicon. And they were different. I was wondering why was that? Case? What was constant in that for which you got different data rates? The dielectric material. That's it. The dielectric material. So the, the silicon interposer, if you look at a typical back end of the line process, like for example what TSMC does, right? Uh, the dielectric material is fixed as SiO2. Okay? So here we have the flexibility of using other materials as well. So the reason why there is a difference in data rate comes directly from the capacitance of those interconnects. Because the resistance is the same, it's the same dimensions. Right, for the interconnects, it all comes from the dielectric constant of that material, which is very low for the polymer materials that we are making use of. Is this for a fixed bit error rate, like you're fixing bit error rate and that's the data rate that you can get achieved? Yes, so this was based on a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 12. Okay. Yes, no, it's a, it's a very good uh, point, right? So if you take a silicon interposer, just think about it, what would you do, right? You tape out a design, you would go to TSMC, they would build it for you. You are not there yet with glass, right? There is a supply chain that needs to come together, there has to be an infrastructure that has to come together. So today if you look at a lot of the glass interposer kinds of solutions that are being built, you, don't, you cannot build it all at a single place, a single factory. It has to go to multiple places. So multiple teams and companies have to come together to be able to deliver a product like this. Okay? So that's going to take time. So it's not a cost related issue, but more of an infrastructure and a supply chain related issue. And that takes time. Okay? And typically if you look at packaging, right, to go all the way from concept to manufacturing takes around 10 years. It takes time. For example, if you take a device based technology, it takes 25 years right, for a new technology to go from concept to actual manufacturing. So, so it takes time okay? and I believe that over time that's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. And that's why it's all pre-competitive research at this point in time. Yeah, please. Yeah, so there is a lot of, uh, in terms of infrastructure, that's quite a bit facilities, not generally as part of PRC, but as part of IEN as well. Okay? So we have, uh, so if you look at PRC, a lot of the assembly level technologies that we have is chip to substrate. Right? So you take a substrate, you assemble the chip onto it, developing new technologies in that area as well. There is also some work going on in the area of dye to wafer level bonding. Okay? Some of it is happening here at Georgia Tech, some outside, okay? and there are some facilities in that area also. Maybe one more? Yes. Well. Does the machining of the black interposers affect the fracture toughness? Yes, um, uh, yes, they are all related. And in fact, a lot depends on the size of the cavities, the number of cavities, the number of through vias you have they are all sort of interrelated and uh, the fracture toughness is a big issue for us in terms of how you actually construct the structure itself um, you know before we create our build up layers yeah. So let's stop here, um, let's thank Swami one more time. Thank you. If you, have, if you have more questions, so his office is in the Pettit building and I will try hard to have him there for more than three years.